Costello of Hard Lens Media. You're listening to us, listening to us live on the Q4 radio station. I'm joined here today with my fellow co-host, uh, Kira Elliott, who's joining us again, D uh, Daniel Lupker, and uh, of course, unfortunately, uh, Fernando Tirado, Lainey Pearson, and Paul DuPont are not in. They will be in sometime later, Paul DuPont much later. Uh, but we have a whole story of, uh, of events that we want to share with you guys, starting from the soda tax or the repeal of the soda tax to a new uh, net neutrality chair that's being selected, as well as uh, updates in regards to the gubernatorial debate, uh, the unfortunate tragedy that happened in Las Vegas, as well as the current marathon that's happening here and the security surrounding it. And plus, we also have a guest that we've interviewed on our Facebook live stream, and you can also go check it out on our YouTube channel. Miguel Avalo of the Chicago Brigada Resistance. So um, first and foremost, we're going to get started with the repeal of the soda tax. Guys, let's chime in about uh, this uh, really controversial uh, tax that's happening here in Cook County. Well, it seems to be less controversial now that they're repealing it. This was a attempt to raise a uh, quite a bit of money off of soda consumption played as a uh, health uh, prevention or health uh, preservation bill that is very clearly a regressive tax even if what their original uh, statement about it is true this is something that has cost local businesses money because all uh, a lot of people are starting to do now is say well I'll just drive an extra mile and get a uh, soda without tax and it seems to be costing everyone a lot of money and it seems to also be bringing in a lot less money than anticipated. And the outcry to this bill is simply a lot more than anyone uh, in government expected. And it looks like the Cook County commissioners who voted for this or have decided and have the uh, 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 veto-proof uh, vote they can take to undo this bill, which it looks like they're going to be doing in a few months. Yeah, and be beyond being a regressive tax, there are a lot of reasons that this repeal is really controversial. Um, some of the things that I was reading up on regarding um, our new budget in Illinois, our first budget in, what, over two years, um, was depending on about $200 million from this soda tax that we are now missing. So we have a story here where... We're talking about a regressive tax, which is controversial enough, one that is meant to incentivize or de-incentivize unhealthy behavior, which I have some, I mean, I have some personal, like, you know, I guess stories around, you know, those kinds of taxes in my own health mm -hmm. and, and how they've gotten me off of smoking cigarettes, for example. You know, so there is that argument as well, but um, what, about the, what about this money? What about this big gaping hole in our state budget that uh, that is going to be filled by this uh, soda tax. Well, we have to take this into account. Remember, who's, who's being affected by this tax the most? It's mostly working class people. It's mostly people who are working two or three jobs or people struggling to make ends meet. And the thing is, if you tax a working class person, they'll again, once again, not be able to introduce any more new income into the, uh, into the economy. They're probably going to choose not to buy any kind of like sugar drinks here in Cook County. They're going to go outside of Cook County or outside of our state. And if people can get something uh, somewhere else cheaper, they're going to do it. How about instead of taxing you know, soda or you know, other luxury goods, let's tax, tax maybe the, the large real estate developers, the banks, the corporations who have been getting away with a lot during these past years, and especially here in Cook County with uh, their connections to Mayor Emanuel as well as other elected officials in regards to uh, building up all these fancy projects, but they're not getting taxed at all. So it's not just that it's – this is a Cook County budget hold. If I'm not mistaken, the budget was being used to fill um, – what, what, was, what was the legal service that they were funding with this? Could someone remind oh, me? I don't know. I it don't wasn't know. it like uh, – like uh, public defenders, or it, that's right. It was, was public it a, defenders was, was one of them. There were there were a few. So, there were so, a few things. So there you have it. You have you know this, we're we're funding for what? How do we? What do we use to fund uh, attorneys to poor people with tax on things that poor people yeah. do just because of numbers? You know, there, I believe it was also pensions for teachers. Was oh, of course. Oh, that makes perfect sense. Well, of course, well, make sure that's funded the, too. The thing is, uh, you know, instead of sodas, perhaps we can move on to uh, something else that could be taxed, uh, and perhaps 
maybe be regulated, and that's maybe the introduction of cannabis. But that's a story for another I have that day. thought, too. I or, was going to bring for that up as well. Cannabis because let's look at Colorado and its budgetary surplus, something Illinois desperately needs. And that could fill in our, inc- uh, you know, a huge gap in our budget. That could fill up all the uh, pay gaps and all of our economic problems. I mean, it's 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 foolish to think that uh, taxing sodas and other luxury goods are going to solve the problems. When in fact, there's probably another much more easier solution. And you would think our elected officials would listen, but of course they're not. And I think you know when we talk about freedom, and especially in regards to freedom of speech, there's, there's other issues that are really affecting us too. Specifically, uh, let's look at this net neutrality that's happening. We have a new FCC chair. Uh, his name is – let's talk about his Wait. name. Uh, is Ajit Pai? Ajit Pai. Ajit Pai. He's the yeah. new old one. He's been reinstated. Right, and he has a lot of connections to the Trump administration. He has a lot of connections with a lot of people who want to remove – He was. He's uh, a former executive in, I believe, AT&T. AT&T as well as other uh, direct communication sites as well. And the thing is, I want all our listeners to understand that if uh, net neutrality is you know, gone, uh, all, let's say you, you, you listen to other news sources outside. Well, the speed of you getting them is going to be much slower. And if you're more of a larger established corporate media, well, of course, their speed is going to be much more faster. Uh, of course, uh, the, the old propaganda around uh, getting rid of net neutrality is that, oh, the markets will be freer. This will be better. It will increase competition. But when you hear that, I want every single one of you to listen and understand that 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 doesn't mean freedom. That means those who are the largest and most powerful will have everything. And those like, let's say, Hardlands Media or other independent media outlets, uh, they're they're going to be you're going to be incapable of getting them. You're going to get them at a much slower pace. This is this is very much like a uh, road road toll. Let's say you're going on the highway right now. Let's say you don't have a toll on your highway. You can drive. Sometimes there may be traffic every now and then, and that's the case for everyone. In this case, this is the equivalent of everyone's in traffic in two lanes, but uh, four lanes next to it, you just have to pay $10 every mile. Mm-hmm. And you can ha- you can go on them and look at that. It They are open and free, and as long as you can pay $10 every mile, you have no issue uh, giving your audience a great uh, great service. So if you're, But if you're a small company... It gets uh, almost un- underestimating. It's not just that the the connection is slow; it's that it's unusable. Imagine trying to run well, a was, website kind, you know. uh, to run a website off of dial-up mm-hmm. in today. I mean, you could run it. I mean, back that was back when they when a picture would take, you know, minutes to load up. Oh, I remember those days. Getting and, getting rid of net neutrality would really create almost like a a, a parallel or a mirrored look at at the way that our le- our legislative body is run. Basically, like. Uh, preference would go to the the highest donor, the highest bidder. It yes. would follow the money, yeah. it, it, and it's exactly the way our laws are made right now. So, I mean, it's it's a mirror image of 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 what's already going on. It's just you know taking that next step into um, the way that we as consumers get our information, which is really dangerous, especially considering that money is the, the loudest talker um, when it comes to the laws that govern us. Mm-hmm. And I especially worry on both sides. First of all, you have, of course, the Republican side run by Trump now who has people like Ajit Pai running things. But then I also wonder uh, with the Democrats because of their incessant talk al- along with uh, establishment news of online news and some fake news or some combination because for established media – Online news is their biggest and most direct competition, whereas before it existed, they had a very comfy setup yeah, with did. each other, and now they have actual competition coming after them. And then in addition, you have the Democrats. I, I, in a lot of ways, I worry about how how specifically they talk about the the Russia attacks, because now they're like, oh, it's Facebook ads. Oh, they're it's this online thing. It. They're going to use Oh, it's something else. Stuff. Absolutely. Well, oh, Russia was under my bed. Well, oh, thing- Russia <laughs> was in my closet. Well, the- it <laughs> ate my cereal. <laughs> well, you know, here's, here's the problem, though. See, it's again with money and politics. You know, money and politics has crippled our democracy. It's to where we have 
we don't have a democracy. We have an oligarchy, and those who have the most money have the most speech. That's the problem with Citizens United. That's the problem with the McCutcheon's decision, and that's why we're having this crisis with net neutrality. How many times have we dealt with the, with the fact that net neutrality is, uh, is threatened by these large interests or by these people that are appointed into power by our elected officials to, who then do the bidding of their corporate donors and the top 1% who choose to profit off of having control over speech and our freedoms. And the thing is, if you're, um, if you're a Democrat or a Republican or an Independent, this should anger you because then guess what? This limits your ability to get real free information. That's the whole purpose of the Internet. Real freedom of choice, real freedom of getting, uh, you know, to get informed because we're not getting information from corporate media. Corporate media is bought out by the establishment, and they're spewing out the talking points. Look at the 2016 general election, for example. Uh, look at how corporate media handled uh, Bernie Sanders' campaign. Look at how corporate media uh, treated the independents like Gary Johnson and Dr. Jill Stein. And then look at how much free press they gave him what uh, Donald Trump two billion dollars worth of uh, free press uh, six at the, by the end by the end S and they were just filming his uh, empty podium and then <laughs> they were uh, systematically saying that oh it's going to be Jeb Bush versus Hillary Clinton for uh, two thousand it's uh, for, it's you know, news for, for, for it's primary it's, it's 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 horrible news and more importantly who has the money the news and, gossip and, and, people and, and more importantly people are not sitting down watching TV anymore they're they're going on the internet to get information Absolutely. and be entertained and. When you remove net neutrality, you're removing people's freedom of choice. A lot of people just don't sit down to watch TV anymore. It's done on the Internet. We get our news on the Internet. And if this is implemented, uh, say goodbye to a lot of the norms that we all used to do on the Internet. The, I mean, a, the, that, news, the news outlets are paying their people like $25 million a year. What is to say that they can't just buy up? the space on the internet you know and yeah. so it is it's very dangerous it limits us again it'll rewind us it'll put us back probably not all the way back to where there was only television but it will certainly slow down progress and slow down the conversation um of you know the progressive honestly the progressive voice it's and then we we risk having a uh a situation where everything is uh that's not mainstream is branded as extremist or mm -hmm. You know, so, something like that's a few movies. But here's what I will say to people. This is a type of event that if you're not calling every week or you're not calling every month, if you really don't have a lot of time, I mean, it's, you know, who your congressman, I think the best way to do it. I mean, you could always leave notes at the FCC, but call your congressman and just be sure that they are on board with this. This is the kind of thing. Look, I got to explain to you exactly what the sides are. You have. Companies, service providers like Comcast, who of course owns MSN, you have AT&T, all these other service providers that are lobbying millions of dollars a year to Congress and have and get people in like Ajit Pai to office so that they can uh, forward their interests. The only way to counter that is to have people like you, your friends, everyone from all over the country, not just once, because that's a mistake we make is that people just call, like, oh, there's a big thing. John Oliver did a thing. Let's everyone call in. It doesn't matter because they were calling in. They were lobbying, I should say, two weeks before, a week before, the week of, the week after, two weeks after, a month after. And if we aren't doing the same, then we very much risk losing this. And if the question you say is, well, I don't want to lose it, what can I do? Call your congressman, exactly. state and federal. Exactly. Exactly. And now, speaking of which, there's a, a couple other issues that uh, should cause a lot of people to get involved and call up their elected officials because currently right now, ACLU has a lawsuit against the Chicago Police Department. And this is a huge crisis that's happening because, again, this is uh, another example of the CPD not being held accountable uh, numerous times of where there's a lot of police brutality as well as uh, – <laughs> Well, a, a lot of unaccountability, uh, mm -hmm. especially from the C Chicago Police Department. Uh, uh, Kira, do you want to turn them on? Well, bit? really, right now, um, as as far as some of the statistics are showing in Chicago, 30, uh, 30, 33 to fifty percent of uh, people uh, in in shootings, basically shot by Chicago police, have disabilities, and twenty five percent have mental illness. And as it stands right now, there have been tens of millions of dollars in lawsuits. Um, you know, for the Chicago 
police department. And um, at a time when we're talking about huge deficits in our budget, I think it's um, silly, on, on you know, not only on like the toll of human life, but also the toll on our budget in general th that this is taking. Um, so I was looking into some of the things that can be done about this kind of a situation, you know, because when you really think about it, I, I, I want to be as fair as possible when it comes to policing, especially in a community as, as big as Chicago, as diverse as Chicago, and in some parts as dangerous as Chicago, I imagine that policing is really, really a scary thing. Yeah. I imagine in a country where there is a gun for almost every man, woman, and child, um, that policing is probably a very scary job to have, um, regardless of you know what the numbers show as, as far as the most dangerous jobs are concerned. If you look at those numbers, policing's not even at the top. But you know, I imagine it's a scary uh, job. So when I looked into you know what's 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 been missing, what's missing in the situation that if it were present, it would make a profound impact. Right. And what I saw was that. In, like, a, a young officer uh, can expect 58 hours of firearms training and 49 hours of defense tactical training um, when they go to academy, but only eight hours of training for de-escalation. That's, that's no good. Look, I understand that, that you need to train yourself, to defend yourself, and, to, and obviously know how to use firearms. Look, I, I did four years of service in the United States Marine Corps. I understand it, but... Uh, you, you have to have a point of de-escalation, especially if you are going to be in a community and you, every day is going to be something different. Uh, and, you, you, look, and in I, a community I, look, where I'm, I'm not on the ground there, so I mean, you, you have to find a way to, to peaceably, de you know, end end a crisis. I mean, the, the gun should be the last resort. Here's what I would say: I only wish that police had to undergo more training than barbers do. Mm -hmm. I think that's I think that's a start. I think uh, I like the way that they do it in Europe where you go to it like a college. It's like a four-year uh, institution where you're trained in lots of curriculum at a national or, uh, location. Um, and you have to not only be proficient with weapons, but you have to, you know, you get training of how to de-escalate. It gives you time to train how to deal with people with mental issues. Train how to actual, like what the actual law is. Yeah, and not only what, yeah, well, that will be part of it. I mean, mm -hmm. there's, oh, God, I read somewhere, what was the thing? It's like, why do we train someone who has to be an enforcer of law, like what that has to do, uh, what a, a medic does, a lawyer does, a uh, hired gun does, a bodyguard does, and all these other roles, again, for less time than it takes to train someone to do uh, haircutting. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that's a start. I think that uh, this this just comes into the the issue that police feel that if they are threatened, they have to kill the 10 people around them to protect their own life. That seems to be how they're being trained because they're fearful. It's like any and there's any issue. If you have to walk a step and you have a 0.01% chance of being shot, no, 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 you shoot the other person. That's how they're being trained. They're not trained, like Kit said, in de-escalation. They're trained in escalation, but it seems very much like what Kier said, that they're just terrified mm -hmm. to do anything because they're trained to see guns where they don't exist. They're trained to put guns where they don't exist. Maybe they not trained the on that. They see community members as the enemy. Well, they're not their community members. They're just... They're just brought in. Absolutely. I mean, and, and I think that that's a, that's a huge missing, too. And I, that was something I didn't even think of until you just said this right now, Daniel, that the, these police officers are not part of the community that they're policing. You know, if they were policing their neighbors, I think it would look a lot different, even with, um, you know, uh, mental illness and, and disability um, associated with it. And um, in a time when it is very, it, it, you know, it's a scary time in America considering – um, some you know we're going to be talking about the Las Vegas shooting coming up, and this conversation about like, well, we really need to take care of our mentally ill. Well, first of all, when is that going to start? Because we've been having that conversation forever. Don't worry, we cut the budget. You know, and and you know, so so we're like, oh, we need to take care of our mentally ill because they're going crazy and shooting people. And then on the other hand, it's like, and then we have police at an unprecedented rate killing the mentally ill. And so I think that the mentally ill that that mental illness is an important topic to be taking on and the other really really strongly associated item here is is guns so i would i would also add into that that it's 
this would be where I give the police a little a bit of credit. We are asking hammers to treat screws and other objects only as nails because cops see things as nails. Mm-hmm. And so if you ask if you give them a screw or anything else, they're going to treat it as a nail. Yeah. And that is and it's not like cops uh even even the the, the top brass decide how they're enforced. That's people above them. That's your Rahm Emanuels mm-hmm. who decide how these forces are used and what they're used for. Can, can you actually go into a little bit about what the lawsuit was about? Um, right now it's, it's... Okay, so so from what I remember for the lawsuit, the lawsuit is that you know they're shooting uh, uh, people with mental illnesses at just such a high rate. And actually I remember reading that if you are in cities, the number one a group of people that are shot are young black people. If you go outside of cities, it's uh, mentally affected white people. Mm. So it's very interesting how that is. Again, is they're trained that if anything happens that possibly puts you in danger, just shoot. Yeah, right. And, and it's a very subjective standard to come from as well. I, I with no training. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. Well, well, and know, especially with no training. Well, this this is going to be an issue that we're going to have to follow up and see what happens because this is a local story. I can't help but think of all the numerous other stories that myself and Daniel have covered, specifically uh, over there at the uh, uh, the exoneration uh, project where uh, 15 uh, innocent men w- who were harassed by the Chicago police for years arrested for crimes that they did not commit, and only now it's finally being it, they're finally being they're they're being acquitted and their their stories are being investigated into because. Uh, this, the CPD was covering up crooked cops harassing innocent people, and this is just another example of, you know, there has to be civilian oversight, and this kind of relates into another story that we're going to go into, which is in regards to uh, the, the Democratic candidates who are running for governor here in Illinois. Uh, last Sunday, there was a forum uh, between the candidates. Uh, unfortunately, uh, J.B. Pritzker and Amir Pawar did not show up. I think I saw Pawar there, or it might have been another yeah, event. Yeah, one of their running mates. Uh, according to this... Um, where, was, where was it located at? Uh, this was located... This was located at the DeKalb... Uh, this is located at DeKalb uh, County. Yeah. Was it at an el- elementary school? Yes, it was at an elementary yeah, school. Yeah, Pawar yes. was there. Okay, yeah, I, d- I, cr- I stand corrected. It was uh, J.B. Pritzker who didn't show up to okay. the uh, forum. And, again, they were covering all sorts of issues in regards to uh, the economy uh, and currently the budgetary crisis that's affecting Illinois. But it, it is interesting that uh, J.B. Pritzker did have a little uh, note to say to his fellow constituents saying, hello, thank you uh, uh, to everyone at the Caleb Stands and Northern Illinois University for hosting this great event. I'm sorry I couldn't be with you tonight. My running mate, Julie Stratton, was looking forward to joining, but unfortunately my, my opponents didn't want to share a stage with her. And it, it was it was interesting, because uh, it goes on further saying, like he goes on saying uh, her career service, but um, you know, if, if you're running for governor, it, don't have your running mate up there. It's the lieutenant governor is not the governor. You are running for governor. And that's a little interesting thing that he the decided. The lieutenant governor is not... Yeah. Elected upon. You know, it's not. Yeah. It's interesting, though, that the, the message he put out. He's saying, well, they didn't want me to be here, so as a leader, I wasn't there. I didn't show up. I don't understand exactly what happened behind closed doors. Perhaps I am reading it incorrectly. But uh, from what I understand about debates, it's when you meet your opponents that you don't disagree with on issues and discuss said issues, not – divvy up the land like Comcast and Time Warner trying <laughs> to keep their audiences separate. <laughs> exactly. When, when, uh, when we first covered uh, one of the Democratic uh, forums for governor, uh, unfortunately, Chris Kennedy and Amara Pawar, or Alderman Pawar were not there. And, you know, it, the audience was quite upset that those two candidates weren't there. And I'm curious to see what's going to happen tomorrow at the Chicago Teachers Union Center, which candidates will show up and which will not. And if anything, it's it's uh, it's going to have to be brought up because in regards to this race for governor, it's quite clear that Bruce Rauner definitely wants to have round two with uh, uh, Speaker of House Michael Madigan. Uh, he's still recovering from the fact that he lost that budgetary crisis battle. He's uh, been losing support with the Republicans. And this is an open opportunity for the Democrats to essentially retake the governor's seat. Uh, but – it, 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 it's, it's quite clear that the Democrats are having a hard time reaching out to the communities because, let's face it, 
the Illinois Democratic Party has abandoned a lot of counties here in the state of Illinois, save for Cook County, and that outreach needs to be rebuilt. Uh, and I don't know which which one of these candidates is going to be the strongest one. There's been a lot of hiccups for a lot of their campaigns. You know, a lot of people are crit critical of J.B. Pritzker. A lot of people are critical of Kennedy because, one, they come from long-established political families that have a large dynasty here in in Illinois. Uh, it's money and politics. And then <laughs> you have the other candidates as well, such as uh, Bob Daber and Theo Hardman. Uh, you know, they have some outreach into the lower counties here uh, in Illinois. And then there's Senator Daniel Biss. But then there was that situation that he had with him switching up his mm -hmm. lieutenant governor. And uh, uh, finally, there's Alderman Pawar as well. I mean, and he's know. not he's not out and about as much as they are, It's uh, from our under understanding. Yeah. And, 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 and the candidate's getting the most spotlight. I mean, I, I'm a citizen who very, very lightly pays attention to this kind of stuff. So, right. And who I hear a lot about are Kennedy and Pritzker. And really, when you look at the Democratic Party and the, the, the direction they're going in and why they're getting their tookuses handed to them mm -hmm. is because they continue to run these establishment candidates. Right. There's, they're like, who, who's a real progressive voice in this gubernatorial race, like who who would a real like progressive go go for? What do you guys think? Well, I mean, I think a lot of people that we spoke with earlier in the season uh, very much liked Daniel Biss, but then again, with that incident that he did with Rosa, that really put a uh, uh, a delay. I don't know what, exactly what the word is, because I don't know what, how it's going to turn out in the future. It, it, it caused a lot of people to question his campaign because the thing is, we covered. Harlan's media was there at the DSA convention at uh, UIC, and all the issues that they voted on, including uh, DSA uh, or DSM, uh, as soon as they voted on DSM, we were there when they covered it, uh, mm -hmm. and that's, oh. that, that, that shouldn't surprise me. BDS. Uh, oh, oh B BDS. Yeah. Right. All right. Sorry, correct him. Uh, BDS. BDS, for uh, those uh, listening, is boycotts, divestment, and sanctions against Israel for how they treat Palestine. Right. And the thing is... Uh, that vote shouldn't surprise anyone that was known. Uh, Alderman Rosa was was there at the DSA convention, especially on the first day. He was uh, speaking at UE Hall. And even he's been very clear about his political issues. And as soon as he was selected by Senator Daniel Biss, it was like a shot in the arm for his campaign to where D he was getting support from DSA. And there was other groups like Our Revolution and Justice Democrats and brand new Congress were kind of looking at his campaign too. But and then six days later, <laughs> he drops Rosa after his uh, stance with BDS. So that puts a hamper in for a lot of people that I, were, were, I think are very much unifying behind him. So I would say to answer your question, Kira, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> we will see. Yeah, I think Bissett. I think that was that was a political hiccup, and I and I, I think that in both directions, he did not foresee what was going to happen. You know, bringing in Rosa, mm -hmm. and then I don't think that he foresaw what was going to happen after um, taking him back out. And I think in both directions, uh, he was just probably taken a little off guard. I'm willing to be a little bit more forgiving about that. Um, but I'm I am curious to see uh, how this race goes, and and really um, curious to to see who we who we really think as as the the left side of the party will beat Ronner. Well, I mean, Ronner has the opportunity to be defeated, but it really depends on the candidate because if you have a, I'm I'm just concerned it might be a repeat, a uh, small repeat of the 2016. Uh, general election where you had Hillary Clinton versus Donald Trump, two of the least popular candidates in U.S. history. And now here in Illinois, will it be a battle between two billionaires? Well, that's going to really make everyone happy. Here in Cook County and all the other counties, uh, yeah, two billionaires fighting while the rest <laughs> of us are struggling. We're still dealing with the aftermath of a budgetary crisis. Jobs are, are, are leaving our state, and all of our public services that we use uh, – Aren't, aren't at full full operation, so we need to have somebody there who's going to represent and work for the people. And so I, I'm curious to see how Senator Daniel Biss is is going to push forward. And same thing for Tio Hardman, Bob Daber, Alderman Pawar, and, and and see really how they're going to retake 
or control the debate field. And Hardlands Media is going to be there at the Chicago Teachers Union Center. We're going to uh, live stream it on our Facebook page, and we're also going to have a high-definition video of it that will be found on our YouTube channel. So uh, we'll let you know what's happening, and we'll share all that content. So if you're listening to us, check us out. Uh, the uh, forum uh, will start at 12 p.m. Uh, they might be a little late just depending on, uh, of course, starting time, but for the most part, uh, this will be very interesting to see, and we're going to follow through with it and definitely talk about it on our next show. Uh, but uh, speaking of which, uh, there's going to be a lot of security because this relates to uh, – because on that day, there's going to be the Chicago Marathon. And unfortunately, uh, we all know of these horrible, horrible crisis that happened in Las Vegas. And the Chicago Police Department right now, they're intensifying security, especially on all the routes because apparently – uh, the Vegas shooter would go to uh, certain locations and have uh, what's it scenic uh, views of all these shootings or, mm -hmm. or like of, of all these major events. He was here at Lollapalooza a while ago and at a few other events, and so I, I can guarantee you this: we're going to see a lot of police out there, especially for the marathon. Yeah. So two things on that. So to go a little further, so he had uh, not only he not just. Come here. He had actually rented a room uh, that was out looking uh, Lollapalooza. Just didn't uh. go to it. Um, yeah. So from the police, I from what I understand, they've been planning uh, high security for a while. And uh, from reading uh, about it, it uh, seems like a lot of the people that are going to be there that are police are all undercover. So it seems like most of them, almost. I'm right. sure there's going to be a huge amount of people. Probably the majority that are going to be in uniform, you know, lining the sides. But there's going to be a huge, I think, like a thousand people that are going to be undercover. So it's just really fascinating. It's kind of a big, as a big concept thing, how we have this mar these marathons that they run, and just how much security and effort we put into making sure things go right. And imagine how much money it costs to uh, host a marathon if you're having this much. And again, it goes back to our earlier story. You can put money into that, and things pe police don't start beating up people, and yet. You can't have them do the same thing in neighborhoods that they're sworn to serve. So congratulations. I'm sure the marathon will be very safe and nothing's going to happen. And mm -hmm. all the people, I would like to say a majority white running class, <laughs> yeah. is going to be just fine all doing this race. Good and safe. Absolutely. And everyone else all gets to hope that someday it's similar for them. All 26 point miles. That's a lot of that's a lot of area to cover it, it will be and I, I i'm a little concerned that uh, a lot of people are going to be more paranoid or a little bit more on guard than than usual i mean uh, this this crisis that happened in vegas is just an, another example of uh really the accessibility of these uh, dangerous firearms that should not be in the hands of civilians and of course this goes into the debate of uh the second amendment and the right to own a firearm here in this country look a lot of people it's it's very easy to get a firearm in this country but uh, the background checks i mean you could just walk into a store and then boom it's like just like that you at, at best maybe have a two week waiting period to get to own or buy a firearm but even then this guy had huge amounts of ammunition as well as High grade military, well, almost close to military grade weaponry that's specifically designed not to hunt, but to kill people. Mm -hmm. I want to add that uh, what I thought was really interesting. So that's it's the 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 uh, add on that he used. I don't want to say it, but the add on that he used on his gun that made it fire very rapidly. What I found interesting is that the NRA is on board with maybe possibly regulating those, and I thought, huh. Now, why would the NRA say that? Surely it's not about the kill count. They, they've historically not cared at all about that. And, it, and I looked at it and I say, who is the NRA mainly sponsored by? Gun manufacturers. What is this uh, unit made by? Just some smaller company. Oh, that's why they don't care that much yeah. if this is regulated. It's not a gun. It's a gun accessory they don't personally profit off of. And then they right. get to look like heroes saying, no, look, we should totally regulate the, this item that isn't manufactured by our donors. But to give you an idea of the mentality that's developed in uh, the gun community, it seems about 3% specifically who now own over half the guns in the country, uh, sales of that, uh, of that unit shot up right after – uh, the Las Vegas shooting because they, as they do everywhere, I mean, it was a much bigger thing. 
is the NRA when Obama was president would all they'd have to do is say, and now he's going to get your guns, and then yeah, gun sales right. would drop. And jump by three like percent of the population owns half. It's funny how it's very, guns. very similar breakdown to how the wealth is distributed. Right. <laughs> That's oh. kind of what I heard well, when, uh, there, when I heard that. There's something I want to add to that, though. Mind you, every time the NRA said that Obama was going to get their guns, he never did. And guess what? He's, he's now retiring, collecting lobbyist money and doing a lot, of being, a lot of paid corporate speeches. So don't worry, folks. Your guns are safe. Well, when Obama yeah. was in office, wasn't gun sales were going up? Oh yeah, because yeah. all they would say is Obama's about to take your guns because and defense uh, spending went up. Yeah, yeah but it's oh, all about it's all about perception because if you get people scared, if you in a sense, if you train people like you train the police, just in different things, mm-hmm. you get them to any time that something like that happens, they just have this knee gut reaction to spend three thousand dollars as if it's their own decision. So. It's again. It's if you just look at it, if you take away all the morality, you take away the emotions of it. It's a fantastic marketing play. You get everyone terrified that guns are going to be taken, so that every time that you say that, they go out and buy a gun, and by the end of an eight-year term, they have eighty guns. Well, that's why it's a multi-billion-dollar industry. I yeah. mean, it's because the way that it's set up and the way that it's it's incredible to me. It was just I was just piecing together all of the stories that we. We have today, and they're all sort of inter- re- interrelated. You want to talk about net neutrality and just taking information away from people, you know, and and the effect that that has on the fear that is playing a role in the purchasing of the of these guns. You know, if you really look at the 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 chance you have to be murdered by a terror terrorist, especially a foreign yeah. terrorist, you have a better chance of being shot by a five year old. Yeah. Exactly. And so I, I, I think it's it's all very, very interrelated in a very scary way and a genius. I mean, it's it's business wise. It is. It's genius. Yeah. Yep. Because, you know, again, every time a terrible action happens, you know, sales are going to go up and the more sales go up, the more likely it is that a terrible action is going to happen. Now, now, from from my point of view, like I, I kind of throughout throughout time, I kind of waffle back and forth on where I am on, on the gun issue and where I stand on it. Sometimes I think it's a waste of time to try and do anything about it. Other times I think that I mean it just seize everything. But I I swip I, just because I'm so uncertain. Right. But I I think it's it's it, it's important to realize that if it wasn't for this I'm going to say killer marketing strategy, <laughs> that the a lot of the issues we would be having with people having guns wouldn't be there because, you know. I, but I, and here's the other thing, it, that how good this marketing strategy is. It has people convinced that they, with no real training – I mean, Kid, I'm sure you, you've seen militias as practice, and I'm sure you've seen since you were in the Marines what actual soldiering and coordination. Hey, soldiering. No, no, no. Hey, uh, you know what I mean. Mar- you know what Marining, about. whatever you want. <laughs> however you, <laughs> see, it sounds – oh, Are we talking but, about but, mariners? What but, but, no, but, but what I'm saying with it is that it's – we ha- it's such good marketing because they have people convinced that with a few guns, they can take out tanks. Because no. they're like, I can take out the U. I can no. stop the U.S. military for coming for me. Little right. do they know, right. a, first a Hellfire foremost, drone is about to hit their house. You first, know. First, first, we all need to understand one thing. Uh, you know, it takes. It's, this relates to the military, all branches of service, as well as the police force. As well, there's a lot of training in regards to handling these firearms. These firearms aren't used for hunting. They're used for taking out. Uh, dangerous targets and enemies, okay? And the fact that civilians can now get the civilian version of these of these types of weaponry kind of concerns me because they don't put the amount of same, you know, the amount of time that you would see a service member put into or a police officer put into, okay? And you know, a lot of them there's 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 very rarely will, will you have like real accountability for uh, protecting protecting themselves or making sure that weapon is out of the hands of somebody. Who might be able to get their hands on it? Like, let's say a little kid, and they'll see this a weapon on the ground or in the closet, and they'll play with it like a toy. And this thing is not a toy. And the fact that anybody can just walk in anywhere to just get a firearm of that kind of dangerous magnitude into into their possession, uh, sh- you know, it, there there needs to be some form of regulation and, and protections to ensure that that type of firearm isn't in the hands of people who are incompetent. To use these weapons because every time these mass shootings happen, they're just not using shotguns and pistols. They're using assault rifles. They're using sniper weapons. They're using uh, submachine guns. I mean, th- these weapons 
will take out numerous amount of people. And every time it happens, our elected officials say, now's not the time to talk about this. Now's not the time to talk about regulations. Now's not the time to talk about protections. But I'm just, I'm just going to end it here at this note because we do have to move on to another very important story as well. It's just if this is an issue that concerns you, if you're listening to us, whether you're a Democrat, Republican, Independent, it, it doesn't matter. Look, these shootings are going to keep on happening until finally there's going to be one massive shooting where it's going to be more than just 50 people dead. There might be 100 or 200 or 1,000. And God forbid that they, that, that they never happen. But we need to have this conversation and we need to have this debate now in regards to protecting our citizens from those who will actually harm us. And this isn't a foreign terrorist that attacked us. This is a regular American citizen who clearly had mental issues. But moving on now to uh, another... Can, can I just say one yeah. thing on this? Um, and I think but I think it's also fair to, to realize that if, even if with regulation, you don't knock it down to zero. It's a thing that you can never truly make a 0% occurrence event... But I think the more important thing that could sing is you can take steps to make sure less people die. You know, since 2001, half a million Americans have died through guns. So that's about as many as we've lost in... Uh, no, actually, I think if you count it since, since the 60s, it's the amount of people that have been killed by every single war is equal mm-hmm. to the amount of people that civilians have accidentally shot. So I just it's something to think about. And now moving on to another issue that's going to be affecting a lot of people, most predominantly women, is the fact that currently the Trump administration, I believe yesterday, decided to repeal uh, uh, companies to allow uh, women to access uh, birth control. And this has definitely angered a lot of people uh, across this country. And I know, Kira, you definitely have a lot of thoughts on this issue. Yeah, I definitely have a lot. There are a lot of thoughts I have on this issue because I, I look at this issue from a very multifaceted place. Um, I am an employer, okay? So I, I, I can see as an employer, as a person, I mean, and I work directly with my customers. I own a business and I work directly with my customers. And I can see as an employer saying like, you know what, no, I, I don't want to service that or no, I don't want to provide that. But here's the thing. I'm incorporated, which means my business gets certain perks given to me by the state, by the people of Illinois, and by our federal government. So fact of the matter is, since I get those perks, since my business gets to live past my life, since, you know, if something happens and I get sued, I don't have my personal assets on the line, um, all of these, I mean, there are so many perks you get for being incorporated by the state. Sorry, you got to you got to follow the rules, and the rules are separation of church and state. This goes beyond, like, we can talk about morality here um, right. until we're blue in the face, but who, who cares about morality? Yeah, don't take away my birth control. I, the state of Illinois gave me my birth control, my 12-year IUD, mm-hmm. until I'm 40, right, for free. So, I mean, th- and there's the other side of the discussion, like, why aren't we just getting free health care as the richest country in the world? The richest, most powerful country yes. in the world. Yes. So this topic is maddening on so many levels. Um, that it, So many levels before even that, like, well, I'm a woman and I should have my birth control covered just like any man's Viagra gets covered. Right? So, you know, I, I don't even go there first, though. First and foremost, you have an agreement as a corporation – with the people of the state, that you will follow the laws of the land. And the laws of the land say there's a separation of church, uh, church and state. And this is the story, Kit, that I was mentioning where, like, it's so hard for me not to curse because of this double standard that, right. these, that these corporations come in and say they want. You know, they, they want all these advantages. They want, they want these, these tax loopholes. They want to be taxed, you know, lower. I love as a, as, as a corporation that I get to write off my taxes. It's awesome, mm-hmm. you know. And I also understand that there's certain discriminatory acts that I should not be taken because I get that advantage. It's really, it's maddening. Well, I would just say, I don't, don't you wish that we treated birth control like we treated gun control? <laughs> yeah. yeah, absolutely. Well, well, Accessible for everybody. And, and mind you, look, <laughs> these the same, the same people who preach morality about, oh, we're, 
We're, we're, we're finally going to bring morality back into this country. These are the same elected officials. Right now I'm looking at the GOP. And look, the Democrats are just as guilty as anybody else, but the GOP, they constantly tout uh, you know, Christian values, okay, and – you know, family first values, but you know, all these elected officials, they have mistresses, they have affairs, and uh, they're, they're just first, recently yeah. we had a case of that. Yeah, we did recently just have a case of one of uh, uh, GOP congressman telling his mistress to get an abortion, a- and he was a strong. And, and then two days abortion. later, put out an email blast saying how you should never get abor- abortion abortion mm-hmm. because it's unchristian. Right, and and now th- and you know, Kira brought up a very important issue. Look, women's health is very important here in this country because. You know, it's being attacked, and the fact that right now they're being denied birth control, companies can have that has an opportunity to, to deny birth control to, to women. It, it, how does that make you feel? I mean, if you're listening to us right now, and if, of course you could be, you know, maybe don't care about this issue, but it's going to affect you sooner or later because there's going to be somebody you know or a family friend or a relative that's going to be dealing with this crisis. And who? Why should the state impose uh, a religious entity? Uh, on us, I mean, there is a separation Absolutely. of church and state here in this country, and that's one of the main, f- uh, you know, foundations of the founding of this republic that we all like to live in and defend. But as soon as that stuff starts encroaching into our livelihood, right now it's women, but guess what? It's going to be everyone yeah. else very soon. And Once uh, your religious freedoms encroach on my on my freedoms, <laughs> over. Yeah. Like that's where your liberties stop when they start affecting mine. Yeah, and I, I think it's. It's interesting going to what you were saying. Write-offs, religious organizations, they get – they're tax-exempt. They're tax-exempt. And so they should sh- – shut up. Nobody cares what you have to say. In fact, they're not even supposed to be communicating they with be anything political, political in any way. They shouldn't be. And yet they are, and no one says anything. I think that maybe it would be good in the future for those organizations that decide that they need to say something to have – their uh, exemptions revoked because they're clearly not following through. Right. I'm in a sense, uh, you know, where we are right now in the way uh, who's in power right now and what groups it is is kind of a moot point. But in the future, I wouldn't. I would like to see groups that have historically gotten away with uh, a lot to be held accountable. I, I, I want to see churches that proselytize for a certain uh, candidate. To just be said, well, you, well, there you go. You broke your thing. Now you're paying taxes. Right. Or at least I'd like to see if ch- to, uh, I'd like to have churches be audited because you see the what's his name? Uh, J- uh, Joel Osteen. Yes. Who, who during the hurricane left his doors closed. That's right. Uh, for uh, the the victims during. Uh, the, the so I want to I want to see. So like, it's a very it's a very big mess of issues. It's a it's an issue of. We have a government that has so many has is so weak. It's been breached in so many ways by so many people. Money organizations politics, like money, yeah. And so you can have organizations that want to promote some religious control of some kind to be able to do this because that's just where the health and the orientation of our country. It's a right now we're oriented so that anyone can get a gun, even if you're on a terrorist watch list. But we're going to make it very difficult if you want to get birth control. But at the same time, we're fine if Viagra is covered under insurance. Yeah. I mean, it just goes to what the priorities you know, are of, of our legislative bodies. And really, um, when, you, when women don't have a freedom, the freedom to choose, you know, whether that's from you know, just completely getting rid of something like abortion to just simply making birth control available – when women don't have the right to choose, it is a burden on our economy, a huge burden. And you, if you look at numbers across the board, decades and decades of statistics show that when women have choice, economies thrive. And not only that, when women have choice, there are less abortions than when there is no choice. Mm-hmm. Right, exactly. You've you got to have freedom of choice, and you have to treat women and everyone else like equals. This is the whole purpose of this republic. And the fact that you have corporations now dictating what policies to impose on the populace, and because remind you again, we have a current system; it's an oligarchy to where the you know large corporations, businesses, Wall Street, the top one percent can influence general elections, can influence primaries, and you know right now we have Trump in the White House; he's surround himself with uh, you know not only those within the Wall Street establishment, but extreme fundamentalists as well. Mm-hmm. And their views on women's rights, women's health is very extreme. 
And if they had the opportunity to remove all the other protections on, uh, for, for women, they would do it. Mm-hmm. And I, I wouldn't be surprised as we progress forward into this, uh, into the continuing years of the Trump administration, what other issues will be uh, taken away from women and their rights. We can't regress backwards. Uh, the whole world looks to us as a leading country, and this is a huge step backwards. And hopefully uh, there's some accountability that somehow the Senate or House will be able to step up. But with its current members in there and their 11% approval rating, um, I, I really don't know. So that's why elections do matter, and 2018 will be a very interesting midterm cycle. More importantly to everyone, primaries matter far more than oh, the yeah. actual election does. A- exactly. Thank you for that correction, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And and really, you know, coming down to the core of everything, just as an individual, you know, this is essentially, you, you know, imagine yourself – in a work situation where your employer says to you, you know, like, I disapprove of your personal life and I have say on how it's going to go. I wouldn't like that at all. It's very interesting how much control the government has over individuals. But I think, like you're saying, further, how much legal authority um, employers have over people because an employer can say, like you said, they could say, I'm not going to give you birth control. If you say anything against it, you're fired. Mm -hmm. And since we live in a country where if you're most of the country that is a detrimental uh, 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 uh event that you may not recover from yeah, which is absolutely yeah and it, and, it, and it really like i just want to push this point home like single payer health care seriously like i feel like this this idea of employers providing health care for their employees is in my it's such a trap in my mind it's such a way to like really, you know, student loan debt's one of the traps. Mm-hmm. Healthcare insurance is another one of those traps where it's like individuals never give themselves a chance to really be who it is they they know they could be right. because they're burdened by all of these debts and all of these fears and all of these what ifs that could totally be hushed and, by and that's and care. that we can actually what you just said we can connect to everything almost that we've covered you can talk you can connect that to the fear that's exposed by the marketing from the nra it's the, it's, it's the same fear the fear is really uh that people are worried about their health care they're worried that they're not making enough they feel like a cog in a machine with no autonomy they feel that they don't have autonomy over their life. And one reason I think a lot of people buy guns is for that reason. A gun is a, is a direct um, symbol. A symbol of power. Mm-hmm. It's a symbol of freedom, as they say, but it's a symbol of power. It is the power to take someone's life. And if you live in a, in a, in a, in a mindset, in a world where you have no power, your boss dictates everything, mm. you can't uh, control. If you have a family, you can't. Take control of your family because you don't have anything to do it with. You don't have the education or the experience. Or you, you don't have a job at all. Or you don't that, have that, that's, that. That could cause a lot. Or of you don't have a right job now. at all, and you feel terrible about yourself. Or you have a job that you're at that you're only at because they provide health care. And then there's speaking of college loans, you have these some newer jobs that will, while you're working for them, they will pay your student debt, the monthly the monthly uh, bills, so that you're you're stuck with them. But that pulls away again that that degree of autonomy. You have, and so it's a servitude. And it, it becomes it, it becomes on some level just like you're kind of a servant to it's, it's to al- that company. Or- it's almost as if capitalism, in the way we're utilizing it right now, along much of uh, Europe as well, is nothing more than an updated version of feudalism with some extra perks. Yes, and it, but with that, it's. I mean, I mean, think of it that way. You have, if you look at that the way we are, you, that's that's why I have. That's why I kind of get why people want to buy guns because it's like it's like the one thing they feel gives them power now of course it can only increase the 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 the, the risk of the in their house it increases the risk of their kids being shot increases the risk of them being shot increases the risk of them dying all <clears throat> all those things are true but there's a greater context to the u.s that is simply being uh made and then taken advantage of for profit this is a, a crisis that we're going to have to follow through on because 
I, I'm really curious to see what the uh, governor candidates are going to say in regards to this issue and what they'll do to protect women's rights here in Illinois. Uh, you can uh, bet that we're going to ask that question over there uh, at the Chicago Teachers Union tomorrow. So uh, we'll give you guys an update. Check that out on our Facebook page. But right now, everyone, we're going to take a short break. Uh, please tune in. We're going to talk about other stories relating to the uh, – vote in Catalina, as well as another updated story that's happening in Oak Park, as well as having our guest on air. So please tune in, stay tuned, and uh, chill out and listen to some Q more Q4 radio. All right. Welcome back, everyone. This is Kit Cabello of Harlands Media. This is the second hour, and during this uh, conversation, we're going to talk about a certain crisis that's happened, or, or more of an update that's happening with uh, Oak Park. I'm joined here today with uh, my fellow co-host Kira Elliott and Daniel Lupker. So, guys, uh, once again, uh, Oak Park, if you've ever checked our Facebook live stream, we've covered the Fight for 15 as well as the debate about the construction of large apartment complexes that are being built in Oak Park. Daniel, you are a longtime citizen of Oak Park. You have a long history there. You've really been informed about that situation that's happening there. So why don't you um, – Give us an update so that our listeners understand what's happening. Okay, so to set the stage a bit, Oak Park is a very progressive, diverse, a lot, of very nice things. It's been a relative. It's a, it's, it's a, what's the word? Often listed as one of the top five towns to live in in the country. It's just you know, I grew up there. Maybe I'm a little biased, but it's a great place to live. So one thing Oak Parkers like is that they this this. Uh, Oak Park aesthetic that everyone talks about, which is a very, very strict, very strict building code that is in Oak Park. Uh, just to give an example of how strict it is, like to a degree that actually will affect how corporations do things. So there was a uh, old building, I forget exactly what it was used for before, and a Walgreens wanted to move in, and Oak Park's like, no, you can't just move in, and you can't because they wanted to demolish the old building. It's like, that's a historic building. And so they eventually got uh, the Walgreens to agree to restore the entire uh, stone exterior. The facade, yeah. The facade of it. And they made it. And they're like, oh, well, you have to give us something cool. So it's the most advanced Walgreens on the planet when it was built because it has geothermal vents uh, built 800 or 600 feet down so that they don't have to use air conditioning or heating. And Oak Park's like, yeah, that's pretty good. So, so now this <laughs> we'll building, take it. <laughs> so, so now this building is going to be a, uh, built. Uh, so apparently? this was a separate, but the, but the point of saying it that way was to show that Oak Park is well known for standing up to corporations. It's been a big part of their history, and in this right. case, but it, it from the villa, from the perspective of the citizens of Oak Park, it's a very much an aesthetic thing. It's a, it's a Oak, keep Oak Park. Uh, the, the 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 aesthetic way it is don't let it deteriorate in some form or another. And the issue is the uh, mayor of Oak Park uh, has been pushing for and successfully uh, uh, passing a lot of new apartment buildings to increase the uh, density of Oak Park. And a lot of Oak Parkers are worried because it's like it's going to increase congestion. Mm -hmm. uh, it's going to uh, uh, block certain areas, the sunlight of certain areas with the height of these buildings. But to give you an idea, Oak Park, most buildings in Oak Park are like three stories tall at most if they're residential if they're non-residential maybe they're four or five stories with like when i was growing up there were only two buildings in a park that were above 10 stories tall now there's i think five or six so you have oak park which is trying to in, in their in their summation modernize oak park and add more buildings densify it with a, a, a more more quote-unquote skyscrapers skyscrapers being 10 f stories tall or more and the citizenry worried about the densification and the city issues that that would bring. So in the case that we're talking about, there's an article uh, where the event that myself and Kit were at, the Fight for 15 event, they were discussing the possibility of constructing this building. And there was massive resistance to it. There is still massive resistance by both government bodies and citizens in Oak Park. But they're going along with it anyway. And uh, we can. I, I'm wondering if this ties into gentrification. I don't really think it does, since Oak Park is yeah, they're, they're gentrified. Listen, they're gentrified. Yeah, okay. listen, that, 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 that community, <laughs> yeah. the, Daniel. I've never really lived in Oak Park, but I can tell right off the bat, as someone who's never lived there, that that place is, has a lot of well. -to -do they're doing people. pretty good like, for themselves. Like, they're like, well to do. And here, here, who are they going to kick out? Like the guy <laughs> making 150 grand a year? I, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, come on. Yeah. So, like, to live in a one bedroom in Oak Park's at least 1,200. Uh, 
more or less. But well, but, but what's there. interesting Sorry. is to, and it is a beautiful community. Yeah. It is, it is. But I don't think I'll ever be able to live there. And what's Sorry, interesting guys. from what the mayor was saying is that he actually, but but okay, if we take back and and we say what is the way to get around that supply and demand, and that is, for example, Oak Park doesn't allow more than one person to live in a studio. That may be one contributing factor. Mm-hmm. But what's one reason? There's not enough bil- There's not enough uh, apartments. There's not enough uh, places to live. And so one thing that this ironically does do is provides a lot more locations. And from what I understand, a lot of them are uh, do a lo- do have like a third of the units have to be low income or, or something like that. That's interesting. Right. Okay. Well, you know, yeah. th- 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 it, this will be an interesting uh, follow through because I'm looking forward to uh, covering uh, any kind of debates about this further in Oak Park because uh, the last time we were there, this was in regards to the increase in the minimum wage and all sorts of people, small businesses included, working class people and citizens who live in Oak Park who are retired and, and no longer have to work a job. They can live their lives. We're all standing up saying that the this, 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 uh, town council or the township of, of, of Oak Park should be uh, the first ones leading for the increase of the minimum wage in that county or in that district area. And the fact that they were behind really angered a lot of the constituents. And it got to the point to where the mayor and all the t- uh, township leaders were – like started to back away from what they were going to do. The reason I like this story, and I think that uh, it'll be important, I think everyone should follow it as well, just as a point of uh, not just curiosity, but a comparison. Yeah. Because we know from our coverage what it looks like when a poor neighborhood is actively being gentrified by developers. Yep. This is a case where it's not being gentrified, it's simply being developed in a way that is kind of similar but also very different. And I think it's a good thing to follow up. I'm, I'm a huge proponent of never looking at things in a vacuum. And Oak Park right now, again, we're going to be following this. We wanted to give everyone an update. But it's interesting to see the difference when it's a wealthier suburb are reacting in the way that they are versus, again, some a place that doesn't have any uh, any voice. So it, It's interesting because a lot of – I'm reading right now because uh, <laughs> when I read the run back down, I didn't know what the heck you guys were talking about with Oak Park, so I just didn't do anything, <laughs> any research on it. But now I'm looking at the, the – and yeah, okay, so there's, there's not going to be gentrification of this community because this community is already gentrified and very well-to-do. However, like really, I mean, working hard to keep people out. And for apartments, rents are expected to be similar to downtown Chicago's averaging about $3 a square foot. So that would make rent of a 1,000-square-foot apartment about $3,000. And currently, the average new luxury apartment in downtown Chicago is uh, $2.98 a square foot. So that's actually less than in Oak Park. Here's, the, here's what's interesting wow. about Oak Park. This is where I, th- I wow. think it comes from a lot of, you know, I believe in history determines present. So uh, Oak Park was actually the first town that stopped white flight historically that's one of it's a very important uh, chapter in Oak park's history and what it did was it said to people because everyone it was it was still a middle class town and people were leaving all around that's why right next to it in austin it's mm-hmm. it's uh, it's very low income and, oak, and why oak park isn't they said to everyone if you guarantee you will if you don't move we will gear the give guarantee the difference in your land value if you decide to move 10 years from now. Because people are always worried about their land value going down. And when they did that and everyone agreed, no one moved out. And, and in fact, a lot of oh, – not a lot, but a few African-American families moved in, but they were only families that could afford to move in. That's kind of been uh, Oak Park's thing, but it's also done a very good job of having a huge amount of accommodations for low-income residents. I believe Oak Park is uh, one of the most diverse by race – towns in the entire country because of this balance that they try to do that's why there's a lot of this part of why there's a lot of tension and why they don't like things changing or because they're you know, it's they're very, very proud of that it, yeah. yeah and 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 like in oprf where i went to it's about uh it's about like a what is it like a two-thirds or, a, or 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 half is caucasian then every it's actually for a an american uh city or school or it's incredibly well uh, uh, mixed. Mm-hmm. So right, but there- you know, it's 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 just really interesting how this kind of relates to some of the stories that we covered, especially in low income communities, to where 
you have large real estate developers moving into those communities, like in Pilsen, like in South Austin. But mind you, this is happening all across the city of Chicago, especially in the low-income working-class communities uh, where you have developers moving in, uh, raising up rates, raising up property values to where – Eventually, uh, renting a house maybe in Pilsen, God forbid that you know the displacement continues on, or in Austin, where it will be costing three thousand dollars to rent an apartment in those communities, and uh, a lot of people who are working two or three jobs won't be able to do that. And I look at this whole thing in Old Park that's being built there, and you know, I think we need to really see what's happening from both sides because if they're going to make it friendly to people who are working or who are who are working a low income jobs, are you going to make it friendly to them? Because if not. Uh, don't expect anyone who's who's working two or three jobs to move into that community, and more importantly, yeah. uh, you know you're going to have to somehow try and make a fair yeah. deal for the people. So that's that's kind of the point that I was I was getting at with with uh, the income. It's going to be very interesting because if they can if they continue to keep that diversity, which is you know like a, a very it's a it's a proud point of of being Oak Park is to have that diversity, mm-hmm. and it's people are worried that. I can, I can say personally, people are worried that it, we're becoming a. I don't actually, just for disclaimer, I don't live there anymore. I live in the town next to it now. But people are very worried that it, we're, we're not going to be Oak Park. And it also, in the article that I'm looking at, says the Lincoln Property Project is expected to have five affordable units. Rather than price uh, more units affordably at the location, Lincoln, Lincoln Property is contributing more than $600,000 to the village to create affordable housing in the future. So that I mean, there there is some attention being paid to affordable housing in the community. I mean, it's a really progressive community, so I'm not horribly surprised by that. And um, and it's the kind of community that is really um, they could really be the kind of community that brings people up in 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 you know uh, the system that we have. I, I I don't know what to call it. I, the first thing that came to mind was the, a caste system. That's, that's yeah. not what we have. Um, but you know the the class. You know yeah. like like you know take a step up. I know the school systems in Oak Park are by far some of the best I think in the country, yeah. if I'm not mistaken. It, it's due to the property taxes to being some of the highest. The, in the highest class. in the country. Yeah. Yeah. So um, it's you know, Oak Park is like you have to have again with with certain. With certain general exceptions, you have to have X amount of money to live in a park with exceptions. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it, it's this is a again, I think this is interesting from a lot of different perspectives, both from a perspective of a place that's not gentrified, but also dealing with development. So it's it's I'm I'm excited. I'm excited to see what happens, but I'm also worried for the same reasons because I want to know. I think it's an interesting conversation to be had, and I think that um, I think that this is one of those situations where, like Kit said earlier, you can, you you got to look at it from both sides, but you can't help but look at it from both sides because both sides is it's completely it, it's co- completely understandable where this is coming from. And I'm and what I'm hearing from you, Daniel, you're saying is that you're excited to see and eager to see how a, a compromise could really be made between the people and the and the development. It I mean, did- I think it's it, it's important to condense people to. To closer vicinities. You know, that's that's a good note, Kira, because, you know, this, speaking of which, you know, we're looking at people talking about issues and affecting their communities. And I'm just going to, like, you know, turn a shift towards something that's happening across the ocean towards uh, in Spain in regards to the vote that's happening in Catalina and the amount of police brutality that was put upon people who were effectively voting for their own independence away from Spain. And. You know, this goes go, goes way back before any of us were even born, like into the 1700s when that region was conquered by, you know, the, the king of Spain. And, you know, for a long time, uh, a lot of these people have their own dialect, their own culture, their own beliefs. And this is the first time ever they had a chance to vote for this referendum to declare independence. And here in the fact you have the king of Spain, a lot of the uh, main uh, elected officials saying that this uh, vote wasn't correct, it wasn't right to do. And when the people unanimously voted yes, you had not only the Catalina police trying to protect the Catalina citizens, but then you had in the national police force move in and systematically beat and remove violently all the protesters and voters who wanted to vote for their independence. So it's very interesting. So it's Catalina, Catalonia. 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 I apologize. Yeah. So Catalonia is a very is I think the wealthy the wealthiest region of Spain. It has Barcelona is there. 
it's a you know they have they have do a lot of very I, I, what I understand their government is relatively progressive at that so they were they've had a lot of issues one thing that they're supposed to be an autonomous region um, of Spain and that hasn't happened in the way there's uh, some there's some court case that they were supposed to get some autonomy many years ago that the courts struck down that caused the entire nerve with everyone that made them want to secede and so right now there was a non-binding resolution keyword being non-binding just to get a sense of people what was happening and it turns out after the vote happened about 80 percent of people wanted to secede but what i think was um maybe the worst if you're spain and you have a region of your country that is trying that is thinking of leaving you what is the one thing you don't do you don't Go in with outside police and brutalize all of their citizens. I mean, that'll solve things. No, 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 no. Look at the video. Like they, 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 they were they were picking people. They were picking women up and just throwing them downstairs. You, you had a couple of videos. Uh, I it think was like I, watching I, I, American police. I was like, at right. least it's not just America in well, this case. Well, well, one, you know, I think I, I, Jimmy Dore said it best. You know, uh, these guys were excited at the fact that they were hurting these people. You had one police officer literally drop kick. Uh, one guy that was just you know just standing there trying to protect other people from being beat by the police. You had uh, uh, police officers you know using batons and using their vehicles as using full force, unnecessary force on people who wanted to declare their independence. It, it, the fact that you have this happening in another democracy, uh, you know, it, 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 con- it concerns me that this is a much more of a larger issue. And I, and I think a lot of people would expect more from the police forces maybe outside the United States, but this is something just as similar. Just as barbaric, and it's wrong because when you deny people the right to vote and you're halting their right to vote, well, then you're also legitimizing your argument saying, well, that government there doesn't represent us. And let's, I want all our listeners to sort of rewind the clock back towards when we declared our independence from the British Crown. The British Crown wasn't going to let us go just like that. We were their most largest profitable colony, and when we stood up to say, we're done, we want to be independent, what – what did the Crown do? Did they say, okay? No, they sent their, their military, they sent their navy, and they were systematically attacking our own forces, and, to, and it took a long war of revolution for us to declare independence. And this is a long, sad history to where you, where you use brutality, people will push back. And I want to add in that another facet to this is that Catalonia makes, a, is again, the wealthiest part of Spain, and a lot of the money that they raise – like, they want to have a lot of these very large improvements, like I think like monorails or whatever it may be. Mm-hmm. Right. And what happens is, even though they make the money, Spain, through taxes, re, uh, uh, moves it to Madrid, and they get the monorails. They get all the updates, even though they produce a lot less than what uh, what, the, what they do in Catalonia. And that's one reason they're very upset, because they don't even have the, their own agency – or the ability to make their own high-speed rail, their deep ports, or... It's like California to the federal government, right? Yeah, very much, <laughs> yes. You know, all of that money flowing out of California into our federal government, well, and then they don't actually even get that in return, and that, you know... I think the largest hypocritical thing, though, is when you when you have the king of Spain, and mind you, he's not from a, a monarch, monarch line, okay? The, 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 the current sp- a king of Spain can send back to Francisco Franco, who was leading his fascist movement during the Spanish Civil War, and basically... Uh, when he took over, he was a dictator, and after World War II, well, you can't call yourself a fascist anymore. You can't be anything similar to Adolf Hitler. <laughs> he just crowned himself king, and those who followed the Spanish king lines, well, basically here you have this quote-unquote king uh, over a republic that where people are supposed to elect officials stating that, oh, that vote isn't right. Uh, no, we don't bow down to kings. We don't bow down to fe- uh, feudalism anymore. It's a failed system, and uh, the actions of the police force uh, – will remain forever because the internet's not going to forget that. But also, let's also note that the Catalina police, or am I, am I saying this right, Ca- Catalina? Catalo- uh, Catalonia. Ca- Catalonia police force were actually trying to defend their citizens, and they too were being attacked I, I, I by thought, the police. I was hoping I would see it in the U.S. before I saw it overseas. But, yeah, yeah. no, if you see the, it's actually quite harrowing to see their local police in line, even their firefighters uh, yeah. who were brutally abused by the, Nine hundred people were injured. Yeah. The Sp- okay, just to give an idea, the Spanish police came on a cruise ship uh, and, offshore, uh, yeah, ship, like uh, an assault uh, aircraft carrier, oh like a foreign and army. then docked onto their uh, docked onto their land. I mean, that's. I mean, again, if you're trying to 
foment peace and unity. Who is their PR? Who is their PR guy? That guy needs to get fired whoever, because that was a bad choice. Whoever the executive, uh, whoever the person was who made that executive decision, uh, basically ensured that one, the people in that region will never forget. They will always remember the brutality. They will always still want independence and freedom. And the, the smartest solution was was probably to sit down to those people who want independence, talk to them, and really make a deal in regards to, okay, what's going on so that you guys still remain part of our country and that you guys have a, a larger uh, seat at the yeah. table so that, one, we remain together as a country. The worst thing you could do is – Pummel them, yeah. yeah pummel no, them. Punch them and it must be—it's so. I mean, and it's, it's I know wrong. this is the least of their concerns, but it's got to be so embarrassing for the Spanish people too. Yeah, you know, because it's like, oh, those are well, our forces going in. Well, actually, yeah. there, there, there is there is actually a little update. demoralizing our own people. Well, yeah. well there, there there is there is a little update. There are some uh, Spanish unity rallies that are happening. I was following an article on the BBC to where they're trying to re- say that oh, we all remain together, and there's some happening all across the country, but I wonder what the impact of those rallies will be compared to those rallies. Where, where are those happen. rallies taking place? Uh, one, one of them is happening in Madrid, the capital. Oh, okay. Well, yeah. that, that's I mean, like, I mean, hmm. I mean, come on. Right off the bat. Of course but there would be you mean the there. people that brutalized are now calling for <laughs> unity. Where have we heard that before? Uh, we, we've heard it numerous times. and It's almost like it's a playbook and, item. And, and in regards to this, I think this is a perfect time to introduce one of our uh, guests who we have uh, here in the Heartlands Media Studio here at Q4 Radio, Miguel Avalo mm-hmm. of uh, Chicago Burkito Resistance. Uh, we met you at the uh, emergency rally for Puerto Rico at Trump Tower. We had a chance to... Uh, interview and also we did a couple of live streams of that event as well um so for our listeners who are probably uh hearing about you for the first time can you please introduce yourself and tell our listeners about your organization and what what you guys are all about all right uh well thank you for having me um well first of all i am miguel alvelo uh, and i am from the chicago body gore assistance we are um uh, a collective composed of uh, Afro Latinx uh, diaspora Puerto Ricans, Puerto Ricans from Chicago, and um, allies as well. Mm-hmm. And uh, we organized about a year ago to um, uh, raise consciousness about what's going on in the island in terms of uh, the fiscal crisis and colonialism, right. and also uh, organize and act to put pressure upon um, g- the governments, right, upon the United States uh, from where we are here in Chicago to eliminate the debt mm-hmm. and uh, eliminate the PROMESA bill, which established a fiscal control board on the island. Now, uh, I, I think a lot of people, unfortunately, uh, don't really understand that Puerto Rico is a, is a territory. And, of course, I think we're all trying to now learn as much as we can since the aftermath of these devastating hurricane storms that are uh, – that, that you know hit Puerto Rico. So essentially, uh, let's talk about a little bit before the storms hit uh, mm-hmm. Puerto Rico. You talked about the debt as well as the uh, political issues that are affecting it. So why don't you el- uh, you know elaborate more about this debt that's that's affecting Puerto Rico? As Donald Trump said, it's putting a dent in our uh, budget. <laughs> but of course, this has been going on long before his administration. So let's let's get a whole story of what's happening there. Well, um, the whole story is is kind of long, right? Uh, we can we can put the we can start telling the story uh, with Spanish colonization, right? So we're talking about 500 years ago, um, but I'm not going to go that far. Um, Puerto Rico has been a colony of the United States since 1898. Um, the United States invaded the island, and then um, uh, as a part of the Spanish American War, uh, Spain um, agreed to uh, handing over the island along with Cuba, uh, the Philippines. And the Virgin Islands, too. Yeah. Um, And uh, so the United States gained control of these islands. Uh, Puerto Rico is one of the last remaining uh, colonies in the world. Um, In 1950, however, after World War II, um, you know, the United Nations... I don't remember the name of the accord, but the United Nations basically said colonies are not cool anymore, right? So right. <laughs> so you had all these global imperial powers um, more or less uh, begin the process of letting go of their colonial possessions, uh, and you saw the rise of commonwealths, mm-hmm. right? So there's, there's several countries around the world that are commonwealths of Great Britain, for example. Um, 
They, however, have a, a much greater degree of autonomy than Puerto Rico, right? They can have their own coin. Uh, a lot of them have their own military. Uh, and in terms of their national decisions, right, their national policy and all of that, they get to make all those decisions, right? Puerto Rico does not have that capacity. The Commonwealth of Puerto Rico um, is only a Commonwealth in name, right? It operates uh, essentially as a colony, and since last year, even more so. So uh, Puerto Rico has a local government, which is uh, popularly elected. We have a governor, we have mayors, we have a, a house and a senate, um, and they're supposed to be the ones that get to establish uh, local policy, right? We have our, our local court system and all of that. Mm. However, all of it is uh, subject to, to the United States, right? To Congress, to Senate, and the president. And uh, although Puerto Ricans are born U.S. citizens, this was uh, a law that was passed in 1917, if we are on the island, we do not have the right to vote for president or any any representatives in the House or, or Senate of the United States. That's interesting because I know that during the 2016 primary, uh, especially between Bernie Sanders and Hillary Clinton, there was the uh, vote for who would be the Democratic nominee. And um, I, I guess, once again, it's a, this goes on to a different subject with regards to election fraud, but a lot of polling stations were closed in Puerto Rico. And it's quite interesting that, uh, again, we're, we're hearing more of American citizens mm -hmm. Uh, I've served with a few uh, Puerto Ricans who served in the United States Marine Corps. These are proud patriots serving their country. They cannot vote. Is there any form of uh, representation, Do, Is there, a, especially in Washington, D.C.? Just, so, to, cl just yeah. to clarify before that, uh, tell me if I'm right or wrong on this. If you live in a U.S. territory like Puerto Rico, it's the only place, if you're a U.S. citizen, where you can't vote. You can be, for example, Kit was overseas. He could still vote when he was in yeah. Iraq. Yeah, exactly. I could. But if, you're, if he decided on his leave to go to Puerto Rico, he would lose his right to vote. If you have if you have residents in Puerto Rico, uh, you do not have the right to vote for president or okay, uh, so any, any so only affects residents. So, but mm -hmm. if, uh, if I'm from Illinois and I'm in Puerto Rico, mm -hmm. I, I could still you vote. Can, you can mail in a ballot, I believe. Right. Okay. So you would do it. Through, you would do that through your state. Okay. But but it's it's quite uh, disturbing the fact that you know you have American citizens mm -hmm. in a territory mm -hmm. uh, they can't vote. Is there any kind of representation in in Washington D.C. and also too? I think for our listeners, uh, a follow-up uh, in regards to the debt, how did that happen in the first place? So right. let's talk first about representation in D.C. and right. then how we got to the debt situation. Um, so it's, it's all connected, right? Um, <clears throat> uh, so Puerto Rico only gets to uh, send one, uh, one representative out to the federal government. This is the resident commissioner, uh, and they are a non-voting non member. Right, so essentially they operate as a lobbyist, um, but corporations have way more lobbyists than just one person. Right, so we're talking about uh, one non-voting representative mm -hmm. in the United States who uh, is supposed to represent uh, an island of four million people. Um, and I, I will, I will mark a, I will make a note about that. Right, so uh, Puerto Rico is a lot larger than uh, the island itself, right? When we talk about the nation of Puerto Rico, we're not talking about 3.4 million people. We're talking about 8 million people. The majority of Puerto Ricans right now live in the United States. The majority of Puerto Ricans live outside of Puerto Rico. And um, what just happened with Hurricane Maria uh, looks like it's going to make that more so of a reality for, for even more Puerto Ricans. Right. Um, so I, I think we also <coughs> understand that this, this reality that Puerto Rico has been dealing with, especially before the storms, uh, there was the debt situation. Mm -hmm. What what led to that? Right. So <coughs> so let's go back. Uh, 1950s, uh, the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico is established. Puerto Rico gets a local government, uh, and uh, through that local government, they get to manage uh, federal funds that uh, were uh, assigned to the island. Right before that, all governors were appointed by the U.S. president, uh, and and uh, the decisions when it came to, to budgeting were all uh, d direct from top to down. Right, so now we had um, I don't know you could call it a manager, right? <laughs> right. And uh, so Operation Bootstrap took place. Uh, Operation Bootstrap 
was a rapid industrialization project uh, that was meant to transform uh, the island, modernize it. Puerto Rico was mostly uh, uh, based on a rural uh, export economy. Um, and now the shift was to uh, industrial export economy. Mm -hmm. uh, also, Operation Bootstrap was involved in one of the uh, largest waves of migration of Puerto Ricans to the United States. So part of the project was to get rural Puerto Ricans, move them to industrial cities like Chicago, like New York. If you look at the Humboldt Park community, that community can trace back its origins to that wave of migration. Um, and also New York being one of the largest communities of Puerto Ricans in the United States can also trace back their origin to that, as well as Holyoke, Massachusetts. Right? This is a small town. Um, up until recently, now some migration is, is changing everything now, but up until recently, Holyoke had the largest concentration of Puerto Ricans in the United States. This is a small town, right? But it's all because of industries, these P Puerto Ricans that were sent over. Um, so as Puerto Ricans were sent over, right, uh, corporations were moving in and were establishing themselves on the island completely tax-free. Uh, they had a 30-year tax exemption. Around the 70s, uh, these tax exemptions were revised, some were extended, uh, and a at that time we saw another wave of industrial migration out of the island and into the island. Uh, we saw the, um, the, the rise of pharmaceuticals, right? So uh, up until maybe 10 or 15 years ago, Puerto Rico was the single largest producer of pharmaceuticals for the United States. Uh, I believe at one point uh, <laughs> we essentially had a monopoly on Viagra. <laughs> oh, uh, I never knew that. Yes. <laughs> Uh, and uh, again, all, all of these uh, development projects were um, made or were encouraged with the promise of tax-free, essentially being a tax-free haven. So what happens? Uh, the tax exemptions run out, and with them go the companies, go the industries, so go the jobs. Privatizing the gains, and then the losses were socialized upon the people. Exactly. And then people were st working like low wage jobs. Exactly. And or, so, or no and so were they basically they were left with the debt left over from that transition, is what you're getting to, I think. Yes. Uh, the other part of the debt is that uh, at the same time that you had this, this process of industrialization, you also had um, <clears throat> an extensive uh, welfare state. Uh, and which which was a part of of the promise of the Commonwealth, right? The the party that was leading uh, this uh, this transformation of the island was the um, uh, Partido Popular Democrático. They're a populist party, um, and uh, uh, I don't know if people are very familiar with populist policies, but the idea of of you know populism is to have a government that works uh, to the benefit of people, right? In in general terms. <laughs> Um, so uh, there were there were times in which life was really good on the island, right? But it was it was um, it was an artificial uh, well-being because again these th that was subsidized by federal grants, and the local government itself was not receiving any income. Now, now there's also the the issue of the Jones Act, which probably threw a lot of Americans off guard. They didn't fully understand what it was, but essentially in short order about the Jones Act, and, and it definitely let us know how, how it's been affecting people, especially now since the storms uh, hit hit the island. Mm -hmm. uh, but basically the Jones Act is that Puerto Rico can only get ships from, uh, from, from America with American crewmen only, and these goods are like raised up uh, higher than what they would get on the mainland. Right. So essentially – uh, what has been the real impact of the Jones Act, and especially now since uh, the, the re uh, reconstruction project that's happening in Puerto Rico? Mm -hmm. So uh, from from the get-go, the Jones Act, what it does is it, it raises the cost of living considerably on the island. Um, like you said, uh, the Jones Act establishes that uh, all shipments to Puerto Rico must be sent in U.S.-made, U.S.-flagged, U.S.-manned ships. So what happens is if if you want to import something like, um, I don't know, uh, wood from Brazil, uh, Brazil, a part of Brazil is, is really close to the Caribbean, right? It would make sense 
that a Brazilian ship would just go directly from, I don't know, the north coast of Brazil to uh, the, the southern coast of Puerto Rico. Mm-hmm. However, because of that law, they, they cannot do that. I mean, they could, but the cost of it, the, the fees that they would have to pay, all of that do, do not make it worthwhile. So they have to dock in Florida. In Florida, they have to remove everything from that ship and then load it up on the U.S. made ship, and then it, that is sent over. So in that entire process, there's taxes, there's fees, uh, there's extra costs that are added to everything. So, for example, you have something as simple as a gallon of milk on the island, and the average price for that is six dollars. So okay, so you have a higher standard of living. Can you explain? Okay, so go, run back, running back to the debt, we've kind of established what led us to the debt. What is the debt made of? Where is who? Who is it owed to? And what were the main contributing uh, accounts? I guess that's the seventy-five billion dollar question. Um, uh, a big controversy around the debt, uh, and and something that really makes us question the legitimacy of it is that uh, a lot of the people that are saying that we need to pay the debt are not willing to approve an audit of the debt. Um, there was a commission that was set up to audit the debt, but uh, I believe a few weeks into its existence, it was it was banned. It was it was um, they they got rid of it. Uh, so there have been a few independent audits of of the debt. Uh, uh, there's some really good reports that have come out from a group called Hedge Clippers uh, that show that the majority of the debt, almost half of the debt, is actually interest. Mm. Uh, so all this information is coming out, right? And if, if um, talking from the viewpoint of, of the Chicago Woody Gore assistance, uh, re- regardless of, of how much is owed and to whom, we believe the debt is itself is not only illegal but, but illegitimate. Right? Puerto Rico is not an autonomous entity, therefore it does not have the the autonomy to decide to incur debt. So in, in, in just to, to sum it up, you're saying, look, you told us to take this debt, we don't have a choice to take the debt, so we took the debt, and now that the debt's been taken and it's fallen apart because of mismanagement, because we didn't have a choice as Puerto Rico to make any decision in this, why are we saddled with the bill? Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. All right. And <clears throat> now, uh, of course, this crisis, you, you definitely mentioned that a lot of people in the mainland have a lot of relatives and friends there uh, in Puerto Rico who are still recovering from the, step, from the devastating storms that have hit the island. Uh, has your organization been in contact? Uh, I know communication is hard to get to. I mean, hopefully it's been getting better, but has your organization been in contact with people on the ground to inform you what's happening in regards to the relief process as well as uh, what's happening in regards to reconstruction for Puerto Rico? Definitely. Oh. So, all of our members have family members on the island, okay. uh, and they are they are our contacts on the ground, right? Uh, we also we also have deep ties with organizations, community organizations, social organizations, unions as well that are on the ground in Puerto Rico and that are an active part of the reconstruction process. Um, my entire family's there, <laughs> so I, I'm very sorry that they had to go through that devastating storm, and as well as the mm-hmm. administration uh, not sending in enough relief. It's, it's been hard. And is your family okay? Yes, they are. They are. They are okay. Um, but I, I should make a note about that, right? So, uh, as as Puerto Ricans, you know, we we have a tendency of saying everything is fine, right? So, like <laughs> life, li- it, it's okay. We're good. Um, you know, I I have family members who, on their deathbed, would say, "Oh, like estoy como coco." Like you know, means I'm 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 great. I'm doing awesome. Right, so there's there's a certain resiliency in that, right? Um, it's it's kind of bittersweet, right, to to see how um, <laughs> colonialism embeds itself in in our way of seeing the world. That um, you know we find we find something good in in anything. But I should say, being okay right now on the island means being alive. Um, a lot of people are still struggling with with getting enough food, with getting enough water. Uh, some areas are getting electricity back. Some areas are getting some more supplies than others. But right. for example, if we're talking about um, the mountain areas, rural Puerto Rico, 
there are still entire towns that are incommunicated uh, from the rest of the island that are still struggling to just get their basic necessities uh, fulfilled and that honestly to respond to these needs they have self-organized mm -hmm. right and how long ago was the storm exactly <laughs> Uh, this was September 20th, so we're talking about two weeks, about two weeks. Two weeks, and, oh, and yeah. these are U.S. citizens, US citizens. who mm -hmm. are, again, being denied resources. Uh, hey, hey don't say that. Trump threw some paper towels into a crowd. <laughs> uh, it's you all know, good. You know, that was, that was really <laughs> difficult to watch because, it, you know, when you – look, say what you will about the previous administration, such as Bill Cl George Bush Sr., Bill Clinton, George Bush Jr., and Obama – at least when there was a hurricane or a devastating disaster, at least they were there with the people uh, hugging a victim. Of course, you could say it's, it's all Photoshop, it's all to look good for propaganda, mm -hmm. but at least there was the effort of reaching out to people who were in pain. And here you have a president systematically throwing paper towels, not mm -hmm. really there with the people. I mean, it's right. quite blatantly clear that his reaction towards what happened in Texas and Florida mm -hmm. are is a lot different towards Puerto Rico. So yeah. I think for our listeners who are hearing about your organization for the first time, will probably want to share information and probably want to help out. Mm -hmm. uh, real quick, where can they find you guys on social media? Mm -hmm. And where can they find the groups, uh, I mean, are the groups that are connected with you uh, on your social media sites? So uh, the best way to reach us uh, is through Facebook. We have a, a very active Facebook page. Our URL is uh, facebook.com decolonize PR. Mm -hmm. um, so, sorry, forward slash decolonize PR. Um, and that's the Chicago Body Corps Assistance. Uh, I, I don't believe there's any other group on Facebook that's called that. So even if you just type Chicago Body Corps Assistance, we should show up. Can you spell that? Uh, well, Chicago. Uh, <laughs> C H I C A. Okay, keep going. <laughs> uh, Boricua is B O R I C U A. And then resistance is R E S I. <laughs> 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 yeah, you yeah, know we also have uh, some videos that we've taken, obviously, from uh, the events. You can look at our Facebook and YouTube history, and you'll find it as well. Right, mm -hmm. and um, I know we're gonna have to be wrapping up this. Sh so I want to ask a few more questions. I wanna, I wanna uh, say, <laughs> 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 I, I, I wanna ask. Okay, so right now, where do you, what do you see the path of the, um, uh, uh, where do you, th where do you see this going? Do you see that this is. Like previous hurricanes, this will eventually, the help will get needed. It's probably going to be too late mm -hmm. than it needed to be, and a lot of people will unduly suffer, but eventually it'll get there. Or do you think that they're just not going to get the help they need when it, when it comes to it? Um, the help would com will come, um, and, you know, ev every day that I talk about this, right, every day that I talk about people going without food and water, and I, I tell others, I, I also say, like, look, I really hope that I am extremely wrong. I really hope that, you know, that my grandmother uh, calls me and she tells me, oh, actually, I don't need water. I'm doing great. You know, like there's plenty of food. There's plenty of everything. I hope that I'm wrong. Um, but this is this is the nature of colonialism, right? Uh, when you colonize a people, you don't consider them. You don't really consider them human. So, um Saying that these are American citizens is, is kind of ironic for me to hear, right? Um, citizenship was imposed on Puerto Ricans. Right. Um, we, we, we never requested it, right? We are, we're born with it. Um, and really what that means for us is, uh, you know, it gives us an out, I guess. But who wants to leave their home? Like... If you're told the one benefit that you get from this is you can leave, mm -hmm. and but you have to leave everything behind. You know, you have to leave the tree you planted when you were two years old. Uh, you have to leave um, your grandmother. You have to leave your the rest of your family behind. But don't worry, you'll be great, right? You'll 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 come over here and you'll get all the resources that you need. Um, I don't I, I don't I don't I don't really think that's 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 such a a blessing as a lot of people. A lot of people argue. Um, I think everybody should have the right to live a, a, a happy, healthy life where they're at, right? Right. At their home, right? With their people. Um, so yeah. I think I think for yeah. a lot of people who are listening to this, this is definitely going to hit them, you know, at home because like 
you know, we don't like to see people getting hurt, and we really mm-hmm. don't like to see the fact that here you have a whole island, 90% of it, almost all of it, was destroyed by this devastating hurricane. And, of course, data is still being collected in regards to how huge these hurricanes are going to be in the future mm-hmm. and whether it's going to be consistent and constant to where it's going to be uh, – anyone who's living in a coastal area or especially in a Gulf area, it might mm-hmm. be infeasible to even rebuild – if these hurricanes remain Category 5 or, or increase in strength to where we'll have to make new categories. Of course, data will need to be collected for that. Mm-hmm. But uh, what do you want to tell our listeners in regards to Puerto Rico and what perhaps might be the aftermath of this devastating storm and the mm-hmm. reconstruction that's going to take place? So th- um, I will say uh, natural disasters are just that, right? They're, they're natural um, and... You know they 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 do play a role within uh, the the larger the larger flow of of, of life around the globe. Uh, the real problem is not the hurricanes. The real problem is the society in which we live in. Right? Natural disasters become catastrophes when you combine them with a social and economic system that does not care for its people, and that's what we're really seeing in Puerto Rico. Right? Hurricane Maria. You know, flooded our streets. Hurricane Maria um, uh, took took the treetops off of everything. Right? It it revealed things that people hadn't seen for over eighty years. But beyond that, beyond revealing <laughs> land, beyond revealing uh, things that were uh, hidden beneath the the greenery, it's also revealed our condition, which is that of uh, a colonial relationship which only benefits the United States and is not really a benefit for Puerto Ricans and should not be tolerated by anybody anywhere in the world. I do not wish for any people in the world to go through this. Um, and my group as well, you know, we, we, we have the a statement of solidarity, uh, which, um, you know, uh, connects us with all other movements for decolonization around the globe. Decolonization, does that mean um, that Puerto Ricans want to be autonomous, or does that mean that Puerto Ricans want to be full-on American citizens? So that's that's another debate, right? Mm-hmm. Um, Puerto Rico is a complicated place. <laughs> um, and, you know, a, a couple of minutes ago we were talking about uh, Trump's actions on the island. Um, I... Uh, we, I will have to say uh, our, our group critiques as well the local government's actions on the island as well uh, because it, 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 didn't, it didn't require Trump to be throwing paper towels for his visit to, uh, to not be helpful at all. Right? He could have not done any of that, and it still would have been hurtful for our people. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, on the debate of status – Right of of whether it should be a state or whether it should be an independent country, um, a lot of people in the past who have argued in uh, against independence used to say, if Puerto Rico ever became independent, people will die of hunger. What's happening yeah. right now? People right. are dying of hunger, lack of water, and there's a lot of disease that's being run rampant, and reconstruction's taking slow. I want to. We, we gotta. We got. We got our time. We gotta wrap this up. But we are going to continue this conversation. We're going to have it on our Facebook and YouTube page in the coming days if you're interested in this. So thank you again for joining. Kit, lead us out. All right, everyone. Thank you for uh, joining us again, Miguel, uh, uh, joining on Heartlands Media. To our listeners, uh, listen, you guys are our main heart and backbone for our network. You could follow us on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Instagram. We're covering news that corporate media doesn't cover, and independent media relies on people like you who listen to us. So Listen to us again every Saturday from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. Central Standard Time. Peace, everyone, and let's all do what we can to build a better future.